I have to admit to not have been entirely clear previously in my definition of the difference between the ego per se and the ego with the attachments. To try to correct that first and foremost, I will therefore call the ego with attachments, that is mental entities, emotional addictions and so on, as mental complex, while referring to the ego by itself still only as ego. So with that out of, the, out of the way, I will focus on two frequently observed behaviors of the mental complex that pulls the ego away from connection with his true master, a relationship addressed before in other contemplations. Guilt and victimhood can be counted among the most frequent of habitual behaviors observed nowadays. Partly it can be explained by the current cultural age promoting immaturity and entitlement as if the world was a wonderful place that previous societies of humans spoiled. Of course, our ancestor human societies were far from perfection that is not attainable in any of the hellish realms, but they were not the main cause of both the imaginary and actual injustices of the world nor are we now more just or better than they were. Actually, me having this contemplation and conversation right now with you, who can be anywhere in the world, means that there were ideas from outside of this realm that were obtained by a truthful segment of our ancestors to be manifest here as technology. Moreover, if it were not for societies and their organization, we would not be having time to contemplate and consequently would not consider reality's nature. There is a pile of bones that were worked to death, drenched in blood and sweat underneath the comforts we currently stand on. This is a reminder of the respect owed to our ancestors who, living in times with no free time, with little rest, with constant danger, built the foundations that we now use. They were tools of slavery. Of course they were, as we are now, to a different, lighter degree. Yet they were also tools of the alchemical transmutation of a hellish realm of constant predatory danger, an actual arena of species with nature constantly trying to decompose all of creation. Our ancestors, exploited as they were, performed the most excruciating of the alchemical procedures through their own sacrifice, so that now we could be in a position to contemplate. And hey, how many of us were our ancestors? Hmm? This reality itself is the promoter of evil. Or, speaking in mythological language, which is not literal but symbolical for something ineffable to our brains, it is the womb of a fallen goddess, with its feminine quality rewarding evil done with more evil but masked as pleasure while at the same time yearning to be saved by its masculine quality that is always put on trial by her. She created aberrations, that is, evil, and, shocked with what she created, she tries to destroy and decompose her creations. In mythological language, the goddess trying to devour the aberrations she helped create can be exemplified in the Hindu Kali myths. This is one of the themes I have touched upon in the couple contemplation, and it is also central to a text I translated into words months ago, having received it from intuition, from that ineffable ray of truth. This text will be made public soon and for free, alongside an interview with an, an internet-found friend who has been hosting a Gnostic-themed radio show for a long time. In that text, it is not only the couple that is united and therefore redeemed from reality, but also their shadow count counterparts are brought together, crucified, that is, bound together into a crucible or, as crucified, a cruxible. This is important because while the two shadows of the couple, feminine and masculine, compete for the ego, they will both use the mental complex of the attachments to force it into submission. 
This is where guilt and victimhood, as mental and emotional habits, are generated. On one side we have sin, represented as a judgment on action. Here, any transgression is deemed to be immediately judged upon and condemned, generating a punishment on the ego. And of course, this is a complete exaggeration. It is neither a judgment nor is there a punishment per se, but it is so programmed into the mental complex to ensure compliance. What transgression actually is, is temptation as it has the tendency to promote addiction to itself in the mental complex. But then again, so does abstinence. Anyway, guilt stems from a temptation that was indulged upon and that is branded in the subconscious as a lingering, unredeemed potential, which is exactly what makes the mental complex be attracted to it again until it becomes addicted. Guilt can, however, be perfectly justified and certainly not always a programmed emotion, but to a sane response to an insane habit or deed. So, again, the middle path. I am not advocating for the absence of guilt, nor am I promoting submersion into it. Guilt can be very useful when in transgression, defined in this sense as an act or habit that goes against the truth connection. It is useful because it is a discomfort that emerges to realign the ego and make it consider its mental complex. The forces that can only exist in reality need our addicted transgression. And let me emphasize this, addicted transgression not a one-off transgression, not a balanced, controlled and disciplined transgression, but addicted. They can only really feed, so to speak, when the transgressive indulgence becomes an addiction, even if the mental complex and ego are not yet aware of it. So these forces will, at one stage, try to deviate the attention of the ego away from that useful guilt, which emerges as a warning against the crossing of the threshold of addictive uh, potential, to try to make the mental complex fall into that state. Afterwards, if the mental complex did become addicted, they may use guilt as a source of food and control. So guilt is actually a tool that works for sanity and truth, but that can be diverted to keep the ego from releasing attachments and addictions from the mental complex and thus avoid the messages coming to him from his truth-ray connection. However, if guilt can be useful, identification with victimhood has no usefulness to it and is always detrimental. Such habit of thought or programmed reaction, that is, <clears throat> of one thinking one is a victim, creates slavery to the surrogate master that feeds on its victim, because the mental complex validates that state of victimhood. As I have stated before, the ego only takes a false master because it has a latent yet unconscious memory of being servant to a true master. Since it got disconnected from that truth master, most of the times through guilt but not exclusively, the abandoned ego then becomes vulnerable to replacing that master-servant relationship with a truth that doesn't speak, with a master-slave relationship with a falsehood that won't shut up. So, we might summarize that the ego who becomes a slave is first a victim whose victimhood state is reinforced by his false master through what he become or became addicted to. The servant, on the other hand, has no addictions, so he enjoys a balanced relationship with his true, quiet, unchanging master. It depends, then, on what the ego links with to form a mental complex. 
and what he then embodies as a personality made up of habits of thought and emotion. Now, if we look at our current cultural predicament, we will find both guilt and victimhood nearly omnipresent. We see how guilt is used on one side to open the door to tyranny, lowering defenses, and then victimhood is used on another so that insanity can become normality and accepted. Often, even, True guilt, the useful kind, is buried underneath a programmed mask of victimhood to make sure the source addiction and transgressions are not brought forth to the ego. In those cases, the victim ego is the perpetrator of victimization on others, but is blind to that under the blanket of his own victim label. So it is not about how many times you are tempted, it is about how you always are aware of where you are and get yourself back in alignment. There is no punishment associated with guilt when used correctly as an alarm, but you do have to be attentive and alert to hear it ring. So merely practice being alert. As weaponized guilt and victim, victimhood are used more and more, we will see an ever-increasingly insane and toxic society and cultural environment until it reaches the boiling point and the lid comes off. At that point, the wheat is separated from the chaff, that is, the servants of truth from the slaves of falsehood, the alert and honest seekers from the willingly blind. The first will willingly leave it behind, being of service. The second will willingly be food for their new false master, being of slavery. Which will you be? I will finish with the very appropriate saying 21 of the Gospel of Thomas. Mary said to Jesus, What are your disciples like? He said, they are like little children living in a field that is not theirs. When the owners of the field come, they will say, Give us back our field. They take off their clothes in front of them in order to give it back to them, and they return their field to them. For this reason I say, if the owners of a house know that a thief is coming, they will be on guard before the thief arrives, and will not let the thief break into their house, their domain, and steal their possessions. As for you then, be on guard against the world. Prepare yourselves with great strength, so that robbers can't find a way to get to you. For the trouble you expect will come. Let there be among you a person who understands. When the crop ripened, he came quickly carrying a sickle and harvested it. Anyone here with two good ears had better listen.